My name is Rory Gustin, and I'm the past chair of the Harvard Village Residents Association. I've been doing this particular job for about 10 years. Amazing to pass it in the back. Um, our current timekeeper is Mr. Robert Brown, former of the ARA, and we have altered, uh, I used to say, we had a 15 second warning I used to go. 15 seconds. Well, we decided the last time around that it was a little edgy and disturbing. So we're now doing a bell system. Would you like to bring the 15 second warning, Mr. Brown? They have two choices. They go. Or. The higher pitch, the blue one. I want a truck horn. So the bell is your 15 minute warning. 50 seconds. 50 seconds. 50 second warning, and then when it brings the second time you're done, and if you don't get done, I'll need to get done. So, uh, these are the rules for the debate, in which I'm happy to be your moderator, and if you don't like the rules, then you get somebody else to do it. But here's the way we start. Each candidate will be given a three minutes opening statement, and at the end of the debate, they'll be given a two minute closing statement. Questions can come uh, from the audience, and they can be uh, asked of an individual candidate, or preferably, I think, to the whole panel, but you can ask an individual candidate. If this is the whole panel, then we will take the uh, questions in order to we'll rotate. Um, Mr. Cressy will ask, uh, answer the first question first, and then uh, Christian Harrington from Ms. Gross will ask, uh, answer to start, and put the answer to the question second down round, and so on. And I'll rotate that through. Um, I would like you all to think hard about this. Can you count to two? One, two. That is the number of preparatory statements you may make before you pose your question. And so the idea of this debate is to have speeches from this side, not from this side. And um, I will, if, you, if you don't pose your question, I'll ask you to do so. If you still don't do it, I'll make it sit down. And I've done it. So pay attention. I think that's about it. Is there anything else? Oh, um, if a question is posed of an individual candidate, the, indi the individual who uh, is posed can, gets 30, sec uh, 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 30 seconds to answer. I think you've already minute to answer. And then any of the other candidates gets 30 seconds to comment on that answer or anything about the subject. And at the chair's discretion, the original uh, question answer group will be given another 30 seconds to reflect. But I think we're there. Um, so who out there thinks this is a good way to run a meeting? Put your hands up. Yes. <laughs> All right, so that's my mandate. I'm your Speaker of the House. I'm not going to do it under these conditions, so I expect your cooperation on this. One final thing. Uh, there will be no crosstalk up here amongst the candidates. I don't want anybody saying, well, you said that last week and it was wrong then and that kind of thing. Then what happens is everyone's trying to think about what their smart answer will be the next time around rather than answering the questions. And the purpose of these rules is not to make me some kind of draconian crypto Nazi. It is to make the meeting run smoothly so that you guys get to hear what they actually have to say, not worrying about run on sentences and other silly things. So without further ado, uh, I will introduce the candidates one at a time as they give their opening statements. We will begin with Mr. Joe Cressy at the far end. <laughs> associations who organized this, and thank you to all of you for breaking the rain to come on out. My name is Joe Gressy, and I'm running in this campaign to, to carry on Olivia Chow's work, to stand up for progressive issues, proudly progressive issues in downtown, and to join a team, the NDP, that's taking on Stephen Harper every single day. Let me tell you a little bit about me. I was, well, I grew up on Wall Road just up the street. My wife, Nina, and I, she's here. We live on Albany Avenue a few blocks over. And I've spent my life working on the social and environmental justice issues at home and abroad. I'm a director with the Stephen Lewis Foundation, working on HIV and AIDS in Africa, supporting women's organizations at the front lines of the pandemic. And I've spent years living and working in West and South Africa. I've worked in flying 
First Nations reserves in Northern Ontario, Ojibwe and Cree communities, working with Frontier College on literacy. And I've worked here locally and right across this country on the environment, on protecting our water, protecting our air, and protecting the climate. You know, I have experience at local, national, and international levels. Proven experience, the type of experience I think you need in a representative in Ottawa. And listen, I'm running in this by-election because, well, I'm concerned about the direction we're heading. On the big issues, the big issues affecting us, we're heading in the wrong direction. Income inequality, the gap between the rich and the poor has been growing for 35 years. Climate change and the accelerating climate crisis is one of the defining issues of our time and the challenges facing our cities. We need an urban, progressive, a progressive agenda to deal with transit and housing, to deal with infrastructure and child care. I'm running to stand up for progressive issues and hopefully, with your support, to stand up for each and every one of you. And I look forward to the debate. Thanks, guys. And next is Mrs. Gross of the Christian Heritage Party. So glad that you're all here. Is my voice loud enough? Yeah. My name is Linda Gross, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here, and thank you for the organizers for having me. I'm here because I believe that together we can make a difference for Canada's future. The Christian Heritage Party gives people the opportunity to vote for the only true pro-family, pro-life, and pro-marriage federal party in Canada. CHP Canada stands for Strong, Stable Families. Its pro-family policy will provide a $12,000 annual family care allowance for families caring for their children or infirm parents. CHP Canada is life-affirming and child-loving and will protect the God-given entitlement of every innocent human being from conception to natural death. The Christian Heritage Party will promote and defend traditional marriage as a divinely ordained and permanent institution of an ordered society. That's marriage as a union of one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others. CHP policies are based on biblical principles that will protect the rights of children to both the mother and the father. CHP Canada is the only federal party determined to fight these issues. Join arms with Canadians across Canada in defending our Christian heritage. Get off the sidelines and into the battle. By voting CHP, you will join me in sending this message to Ottawa. Voting CHP is the principal thing to do. Better solutions begin at CHP. So glad to be here, glad to meet you, and looking forward to this debate. Thank you. Ms. Camille Lapchuk of the Green Party. Priorities. 
They're not driven by evidence, but they're driven by what's popular and what's easy. Uh, the Green Party is not like that. We know we can't wait for issues to become popular before we tackle them head on. I want to read you a quote from Brian Malone, because that's exactly one of my heroes. I some of the work he's done. He said once that leadership is the process not only of perceiving the need for change, but making the case for change. Leadership does not consist of imposing unpopular ideas on the public, but of making unpopular ideas acceptable to the nation. And you know, that's the task I really see for the government, and uh, I see that we should take a leadership role based on evidence and sound science, uh, not simply what's popular. So I'm running to you join Elizabeth May. And uh, Bruce Hyde, our second Green MP in Parliament. Uh, Elizabeth jokes that right now the caucus has perfect gender parity, but she'd be happy to spell another way to that. So if there's one thing that Elizabeth has shown in her short time in Parliament, it's that Green MPs uh, can make a difference. Uh, we're free to vote uh, how we want on the issues that matter. We're never forced to cheer on demand, jeer on demand, or sit down and shut up when our party leaders tell us to. Um, I want you to help me save democracy by doing something unexpected. Elect me in Trinity Spadina, and I promise that we'll send a message to the other parties. Uh, I promise that I will talk about nothing but the issues. So if you listen to me tonight and you like what you have to, uh, what, what you hear, then I'm going to ask you to consider your uh, voting green. I'm coming just a moment to now, Mr. Tremell. Allow me. I introduce you. Oh! <laughs> this promises to be. He promised to be entertaining. This is uh, running independent as an independent, and I think he would might have said proudly and hustling independent. Mr. John Trumell. Hi there. I am in the Guinness Book of Records for running in more elections than anyone else in history. <laughs> Counting the last brand provincial and the brand free mayoralty and this federal, it's my third hat trick in 82 elections. I also hold the record for most elections lost. Now, now the Guinness Book of Records put me on the same page as Her Majesty the Queen under royalty and government. Didn't go to my head because the Americans put me on the same page as the world's biggest bagel. <laughs> Why am I running? Well, how can I run? and get 20 to 30 people off the street to nominate me for their member of parliament in one hour. Well, I show them my life. No, 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 I have one of them. Let's, how many people have heard of the Let's Time Banking Green Dollar Program? Anybody? There used to be a Let's in Toronto. Anyway, I want the people to say, look, you ever heard of Let's? No. Let's allow single, poor mamas and poor people to list what lights are available to double and triple duty babysit. So that the other mamas can go out for a night off and they pay each other with one hour bills, even when they're broke. Can you understand how a let's might reduce suicides amongst depressed single mothers and poor people? Local employment trading software. And that's how I get, I say, don't need to vote for me, just give me the chance to explain let's to the voters. They've never voted for it before, but I want to keep trying. And 20 out of 30 people sign and nominate me for parliament in one hour off the streets because it ain't the quality of the candidate, it's the quality of the program. And I'm the only engineer who's got my program code. There's this English. Okay, why this is serious? Well, you've been fooled for the last three years. Since Fukushima, remember in Japan when it blew all that fog out of the sky? And three days before the plume hit BC, the Harper government turned off the fallout detectors. Didn't want to worry you. Didn't want you to stay home from work. And baby deaths in BC tripled. I did the math. I'll bet. Oh, by the way, anybody ever watch Rounders, the famous Holcomb game? Well, I was the teaching assistant of Canada's only mathematics and gambling course in Carleton for four years. If you Google for great Canadian gambler, I come up. Remember Matt Damon at the Taj Mahal saying, we don't play together, but when was the last time you saw one piranha eat another? Well, I was known as the professor at that Taj Mahal, the Wizard of Odds, the great white shark amongst the piranha. So what am I doing here? 
I want to show you how to quit getting your bite taken out of you by the loan sharks by running your own interest-free chips, which is what I'll talk about for the rest of the night. Thank you. I was in, at the conference this, this fall and there was a guy running for a party called the Rents Too Damn High Party. You might want to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a fire fight. So before we start, I want to uh, just uh, inform the community that we've had a very bad decision on the old needs day. We've all been working together to stop this 25 story student residence at college in Spadina. Unfortunately, the old needs will us once again. Uh, I, I feel as an obligation as the Edward City Council to pass that on. Uh, the fight for college here, the fight for better planning in the city continues. Uh, and so with that bad news, I will try to launch a campaign platform that uh, hopefully makes you smile. We need stronger cities. Part of it is a planning conversation, but a lot of it has to do with how we deal with housing. And student housing is part of that. But it also has to do with transit. It also has to do with our water infrastructure. And we'll get to that talk about the environment. There's a significant challenge with the way we manage water, the way water consumes electricity in Toronto, and federal infrastructure money that's absent in that funnel is hurting all of us. And the final issue that no one talks about as part of the national urban strategy is culture. Culture is a fundamental part of any civic infrastructure. Arts and the arts and culture create cities, and cities are the place where the arts and culture actually come into play. And urban agendas that ignore that and put culture off to the side miss a critical part of city. But the fundamental thing we do, and the program that we haven't had, and the reason that I got into journalism, and the reason I left journalism to come to City Hall and come to this neighborhood to represent this community for eight years at Down City Hall, is the issue of housing. We have not had a national housing program in this country literally since the mid 80s. All governments have failed. It doesn't matter whether it's the NDP at Queen's Park, it doesn't matter if it's the Liberals in Ottawa, it doesn't matter if it's the Conservatives who started most of the housing cuts in the Brown Mall Rowing. Housing has been taken away from this city and other cities right across the country, and that needs to change. And the reason I joined the Liberal Party, and the reason I'm running this campaign, is to, yes, to bring the national urban agenda to the focus of the national problems and to make cities right across this country stronger. But everybody talks about transit, housing is talked about afterwards. For me, housing is where you start. Housing is the one issue that drives savings in the federal health care budget, savings in the average of First Nations communities, and allow them to tackle some of their issues. Housing fixes some of the challenges students and families have sending their kids off to university. Housing, housing, housing. It's got to change. And so I'm changing the campaign platform uh, that, that, uh, that uh, I am seeking to represent here by, by, by joining the Federal Liberal Party. I'm changing the way we talk about cities and we talk about housing by campaigning for a seat in Ottawa. I need your support to make that change happen, not just in this riding, not just in the city, but across the country. When you build stronger neighborhoods, you do build stronger cities. And when you build stronger cities, you get a stronger country. But you don't do it if you don't stand up and fight for it. Thank you. Sticking within the time on the first round, this goes for the debate. Um, we're now at the point where we are going to start taking questions. So I would ask people who want to ask questions to stand in front of each microphone and form a bit of a line. Um, and we'll take them alternately uh, from side to side. And while you're doing that, I want to name the organizations that hired the hall and paid the bill for it. Uh, they should be roundly thanked for doing it. And if you're not members of this organization, and you could be, then shame on you. <laughs> Sponsoring organizations are the Annex Residents Association, the area that we are now having this debate, the Harvard Village Residents Association, Huron Sussex Residents Organization, the Palmerston Area Residents Association, the Seton Village Residents Association, the Harvard Street BIA, and the Door Annex. BIA. A round of applause for the organization. We'll take a first, first question from the mic here on my right. And uh, away you go. Is it the main person? Pardon? Someone over here first. Oh, I'm, leave that to me. You don't have to worry about it. What's going to happen? You will answer the first question first, second question, Ms. Gross, and so on. And I'll rotate around what I will say. 
your turn each time, so you don't have to remember. All right, so you're taking the first question. Okay, given the absence of a conservative candidate, let's take the Can you make the mic up loud? Can you hear me now? No, I don't think it's on. Yeah, it's not 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 on. Uh, say check, check into the mic. <laughs> While that gets sorted, maybe we'll take that on this side. Yes, uh, in reference to what you started to say, uh, the conservative candidate was invited but declined. I'm making a lot of comment on that. Uh, Mr. Longer, would you like to begin the question? Sure. Uh, it's already been alluded to by one of the candidates. Uh, this is a federal election. We're looking forward to which of you is best qualified and most passionate about bringing scientific thinking back into the government, which seems to be depends on going back to the people? Um, you'll also be representing Trinity Spadina. So who are you going to bring scientific thinking, scientific industry, creativity, uh, innovation into, into this writing? I'm thinking DuPont Street, which used to be an industrial spine. So Lonely, I think you've... Uh, and the right. buildings there are waiting for science and innovation. Who's going to bring it in? Thank you. Mr. Cressy, you're first. Well, thank you. It's a great question. In, five, in the last five years, the Stephen Harper government has fired 2,000 scientists. And when they're not firing scientists, they're muscling the ones we have. And it's not just ignoring scientists in the Department of Fisheries and Oceans or the Ministry of Environment, it's also cutting the long-form census. We have no idea who lives in the new buildings that are being built down south because we don't ask them anymore. We have a conservative government that does politically-based fact-making as opposed to fact-based policy-making. That's what we need in this country. We need evidence-based decision-making. When I look at climate change, I look to the experts. When I look at building a national transit strategy for stable, predictable, and permanent funding and what to go where, I look to the experts. That's the commitment of the NDP. That's the commitment of me. Thank you. Mr. Rosen, you're next. Would you rather pass? You're next. Do you want to answer that question about science? I will pass. You will pass? Ms. Latra? Thank you. I'm really glad you asked that question because, uh, as you noticed, uh, it's all about putting science back in decision making in Ottawa. Uh, Joe sort of touched on some of the issues. We slashed the long term census. We're muzzling climate scientists. We're defunding Environment Canada and all of our science programs. We're literally destroying books at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. If that doesn't because of a big evil book writing, I'm not sure what does. Uh, we have to roll back the cuts that Stephen Harper has made in this area. We, uh, we can't make one, uh, public policy blind and uh, based on you know what we sort of might think has to be happening. We've got to make policies on the basis of sound science. Um, you know, you also touched on uh, the idea of innovation uh, and how science plays into that. Um, not only do we need to look at science, we need to fund uh, scientists who are doing innovative work and move forward in that direction too. Thank you very much. Thank you If you're new to for student vote Turmel, you'll find my explanation to the grade fours about how I got a grade 17 in science, systems engineering, 98 percentile math, 100 percent physics, and why, of course, would they think that's important? Well, here's your big chance to actually send someone to Parliament who knows something about science. So it isn't my job, it's your job. And you finally got a chance to vote for a guy with a science degree. Thank you, Mr. Bernard, we can on. I think the good news for voters in this part of the city, in this part of the country, is that between the Greens and the NDP and the Liberals, uh, we all have a great deal of faith in science and, and intellectual pursuits that give us uh, facts to base policy rather than uh, working it the other way around. And so, the long-form census, which in particular works Toronto because we have been woefully undercounted and deliberately, there's a lawsuit that's working with its way through the courts, hurts us when we get the capital funding to deal with some of the challenges we have, especially around transit and housing. The issue that, 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 uh, that hasn't been addressed is the DuPont study. One of the things that we've been working very hard at in this part of the city is changing the way we do employment lines. We're not going to get another auto industry landing in, in, at the corner of Christie and DuPont. 
What we need to do are find the micro-projects that build small economies and grow them into medium-sized economies, but do it in a way that's compatible with local residential areas. This is a policy that goes through the city hall. It's one that the federal government can accelerate by supporting the way the cities build themselves with federal infrastructure funding. Thank you very much. Is it work? Oh yeah, it works now. Okay, you're on. Okay, so uh, what I was going to say was there's no conservative at the table, which says something about the rather anti-conservative sentiment of this riding. So I'd like to know what each of you will do to get rid of Stephen Harper after the next election, barring your party winning a majority of seats. Thank you for the question, and we'll start with Ms. Rose. The NDP supports proportional representation. The Liberals are opposed. 
But that's in the future. Right now, we need to work together to defeat Stephen Harper and form a progressive government. We tried it in 2008, 2009, before the coalition with the liberals. Michael Ignati became the leader, tore it up, and said, only a liberal government. Six years later, Harper's still in power, and Tom Alcair has said, we will work with the other parties to defeat Stephen Harper and form a progressive government. And Justin Trudeau has said, and I quote, I will not work in coalition. That's a quote. This is a key difference. My objective is, and Tom Walker's objective is defeating Stephen Harper. It's more than party politics. They elect us to work together and get results. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank you all for the great respect that you're showing all the candidates. I just want that to be very important. You're next. Hey, I just want to know how we're going to diversify. Diversify our global economic uh, dependence on the states so that we stop being dependent on them. We're obviously paying more than they are for our own natural resources. This has to stop in an unfair shape in our own country. Thank you very much. There's a lot of chapter Sorry, I didn't hear very well the very first part of your question. Can you uh, how we're going to diversify ourselves away from the states economically <laughs> while they're going through the world, as well as the fact that they're paying less for our natural resources than we are as the this has to stop in an unfair shape. Okay, great. Good question. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've tied our economy so uh, so closely to the states, particularly when it comes to uh, resource extraction. Uh, what we're doing right now with respect to products from the oil sands is uh, attempting to ship them uh, to other countries where they can be fined there instead of uh, keeping jobs in Canada, uh, for example. So, uh, for sure, we have to move away from that. Thank you, Mr. Trammell. Okay, so the answer is to do more economy at home so we don't need to export so much. Now, why can't we buy everything we produce? Everybody borrows the principal, pays to produce the goods, and they all gotta raise the price to get back the principal plus the interest, P plus I. And guess what? We only got P, the principal. We can't pay P plus I. Something always remains unsold, and we must get into the export game with the rest of the world. But if we used a local employment trading system interest-free poker chip for our collateral, we could do lots of local economy at home and only export excess we need. So while you use bank money at usury, you have to export and play that game. But when you run your own chips without usury, you don't have to anymore. We've got enough money in the home market to buy everything we produce. Vermont. Diversifying trade is critically important, and, and you do that with trade agreements that do two things. One, they, they create reciprocal uh, opportunities for countries that are signing them. The second thing is, is that you make sure that the behavior of Canadian corporations is consistent with the laws and rules and regulations at home, so you don't end up with some of the challenges that mining companies have created in Latin America. But the second thing is you take a look at situations uh, like Asia and the Pacific Rim opportunities that present themselves. You must also make sure that people have the same rights as dollars. And for that, you need to make sure that the flow of goods and services includes a just flow of people as well. And we have had and the policies, you can see with the Country Workers Program, we have had policies which punish individuals while purporting to, to support and, and, and underpin the economy. And we are in a very precarious position because of that. We have an over-dependence on the United States, and we need to rethink some of those issues. But you don't do it in an antagonistic position to work towards the trade partners. You do it in cooperation, collaboration with them, and you make sure that you defend Canada's interests while also making sure you protect your interests at home, including the right to source locally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think climate change is one of the defining issues of our time. 60, 70 years from now, what are we going to tell our kids? That we ignored the science and the signs of climate change because it would help us win elections? That's not good enough. Here's what the NDP would do. First, we would put a price on carbon for cap and trade and invest the revenues in a green energy economy for the transition. Second, we would stop the $1.2 billion that go to subsidize big oil in this country, which was $8.3 billion over nine years by the liberals. We would stop those subsidies and invest it in green technology. 
we would say no to the Keystone oil sands pipeline, which would sell our to Here are my 15 seconds coming on three principles. Respect for First Nations with an eye to long-term prosperity and always, absolutely always, an eye to sustainability. Thank you very much. Here we go. All economists agree that free generator, uh, sorry, free enterprise capitalism is the greatest generator of wealth for the greatest number of people. Having companies that are Canada uh, marketed and to not have uh, um, companies, foreign companies dealing on an unbalanced playing field where wages, safety, environmental standards, standards are lower than Canadian ones are not existent. Canada needs to buy Canada, made in Canada, for Canadians and, and Canadian employees making things. Thank you. We have our next question coming from over here. Thank you. Um, our current debt acquisition model basically makes it impossible for us to pay back our old loans unless we borrow new loans. So my question is, what would your party do to reform the economic model so we don't continue to acquire debts and kick the can down the road, so to speak, until we eventually either, you know, declare bankruptcy or have a IMF contingency loan, which, you know, we're soon going to be uh, downgraded by the S&P. So Thank how you. How would you reform the economic model? Mr. Jarmel, you are the number one on this one. Explain to the kids when I ran for Bradford Mayor that the Let's program would allow me to pay them with bus tickets to shovel the snow and help old people have less heart attacks, clean the park, stuff like that. I explained to the kids how the Let's program would allow people to work for the provinces and to get paid with tickets they could use for hydro, taxes, medical, and licenses. A lot better than bus tickets, but harder for adults to understand. The kids get tickets right away. I can do the same with the Bank of Canada, run a PayPal, log on, not MasterCard, thousand hours of labor, settle all your interest bearing debts, all payments go against principal, someday you're out of debt. So it's only the interest causing the problems, and the web software is the only interest-free software you've ever heard of before, and you never voted for before, and you're probably not going to get it now either. <laughs> because they never got it. Well, the Liberals have a very um, proud record of balancing the budget and, and getting the country's finances into a position um, that, that put us in surplus. And, and the Tories have squandered that and they put us into a very difficult spot. Those decisions have got us there were tough. But when the country started to grow again, and when those cuts um, had balanced the most, what you saw then was a strategic reinvestment in the economy, in housing, in daycare, the clone of the whole series of issues that allowed us to build a good, strong country that started to deal with some of the challenges that they had in the individuals. That's a liberal policy. Good, prudent fiscal management that gets us out of debt, but at the same time, what you get when there are surpluses is a substantial and a robust investment in cities, in social programs, in some of the injustices of the past. I just want to quickly address one issue that was raised by one of my colleagues here, and that's the, the, the issue of Montclair. He has said he wants to be a partner to him. That's not what you just said, Mr. Gresson. Thank you. Mr. Gresson. Thank you. You know, listen, for my generation's entire life, we've been told that the problem is the deficit, and therefore the solution under liberal and conservative governments was to cut services and jobs. Or we've been told that the problem is taxes, and therefore the solution is to cut taxes. Those are not the problems. Taxing and spending is the role and function of a government, any government. Tax is not a four-letter word. What we need to do in this country is invest in, invest in a strong economy by dealing with the urgent issues affecting our cities, like child care and housing and transit. Investing in a green energy economy to drive the future for the next generation. What we need to do when we talk about the economy is talk about jobs. Jobs, good, decent, well-paid jobs. That will, that's what creates a strong economy. As an NDP government, we would take on youth unemployment, 
We would deal with the national transit strategy to invest, and we would invest in green energy. Thanks. The CHP would do a, a stimulus plan where we would take money from Bank of Canada rather than the charter banks. We now have, as of 1974, we had a $20 billion debt. We are now up to a $1.2 trillion debt. debt. We would not go to the charter banks, we would go to the Bank of Canada, do interest-free loans for housing bridges. Um, the compound interest that we are going to face, and that's a debt we're putting on our children. And it's not only immoral, it's theft. It's our children will be buying oats to feed a dead horse economy. We need to um, make deficit spending illegal and get rid of the debt. Ms. Lapcha. Thank you. Our, our problem is that we haven't been taxing well and we haven't been spending well. We've treated taxes for too long like uh, tax is a bad word. It's not. Canadians are willing to pay taxes when we get appropriate services and we're, when our money goes to fund things that are in our collective interests. What we don't want is to see our money being spent on uh, operations like the oil sands or one point four of our tax dollars or one point four billion tax dollars every year going to fund those operations. We don't want our money being spent on expensive nuclear projects that don't do anything to do with greenhouse gas emissions. So what we need to do is put a price on carbon through a fee at the source, raise money that way, start shifting taxes on to societal bags, things that we don't want. Move them away from societal goods like jobs and like revenue and uh, get ourselves out of debt and fix the problem that way. Thank you very much. Uh, we're ready for our next question. Good evening. Um, just in light of all the undercover investigations that have been coming out with um, showing just the horrendous neglect and abuse on factory farms in Canada, I'm just wondering what uh, the candidates and, uh, and your parties, um, what initiatives you might have to address what seems to be a uh, culture of cruelty right now in the Canadian agricultural industry. Thank you very much. Mr. Bond, you are up. Mike, the agricultural industry is our industry, and they need to be dealt with and regulated in a process that's not dissimilar to the oil industry or, or the auto industry. They need to be regulated, not just on the cruelty issue, but as a journalist, I covered Walkerton, and I saw what happens firsthand when, when you have poor environmental performance combined with poor public services and the cuts that others have talked about. And so changing the, the, the way we do government is a fundamental way to get at some of these issues. Not to stake out ideological positions and then figure out the process. Not to choose a pipeline and then do the consultation. And not to okay processes and then figure out what the mistakes are. You have to do what we did in Ward 20, what I did in the city hall for eight years. You have to fundamentally rethink government process. You have to bring stakeholders to the table, all of them, not just some of them. And then you have to work together for the best outcome for the country, which includes producing food, but also means producing it safely. Consumption, but also the industrial impacts of the debt. Thank you very much. It's a really important question. Let me address it directly. And I've spent some time on my, I've served on the board of the Stock Community Food Center, working on farm to table initiatives here, as well as the Everdale Environmental Center. I was a future farmer intern once years ago. We need to do a couple things. We need to discourage model crop. We need to do better labeling. Labeling of GMOs. My goodness, let's get to it. Fund the National Farm Animal Care Council properly and sustainably. And the most important thing, and I allude to this off the top, is we need to become a leader in environmentally sustainable food production. That's what we need to do. That's what I hope to tell you. Thank you. Ms. Bill. The CHP too supports the labeling of GMO. The, um, Right should be to the consumer, the people that are buying the products, whether they uh, like the or not, it's for them to decide, and it's not for it to be opposed on by the government. 
And as far as food goes, a country that cannot feed itself is a colony. So we really do need to support our farmers, support small farms, and uh, be considerate to their needs. Thank you. Thank you. Well, partly I'm missing something, because I had a question about animal protection of what I know. So we have a kind of answer to that too. I'm reminded of a quote that I really like from Gandhi. He said that the strength of our uh, nation and its moral character can be judged by the way we treat our animals. And if that's the case, we get an F. Animals on factory farms suffer immensely in this country, and yet there are almost zero federal regulations that address their suffering and that stop them from being kicked and abused and, and punched and uh, treated horribly, like you've seen in the recent spate of undercover investigation videos to, uh, to hit the airwaves. Uh, we need to do more. The animals that we eat are no different from the cats and the dogs that we share our homes with. They're all deserving of respect. They're all sentient. They experience joy. They experience suffering just like us. Uh, and we need to do better. We need to implement federal standards. Um, you know, frankly, the other parties have done worse than nothing on this issue. I can't even find animal issues when I look in their platforms. Uh, the Green Party's had a full animal protection plank in our policies since about 2005. Uh, it's an issue I care strongly about and that the Green Party will champion. Yes, we care and we need more. Are any solutions? No. As long as small farmers don't have a chance in the financial competition for loans, they can't compete with the big boys. Never will. And it happens to be the cheapest way to create chickens this way, torture them, mass production, big profits. Little farmers can't do that. But as soon as they got an interest free loan at the Bank of Canada, and now they can get their seed and sell it and pay off later, all their problems are over. So we're back to fixing interest free money as the only solution, despite what they really want it. I don't know. Something really has to be done quickly. They're all upset. It's terrible. But they all got no way to pay for any reform except me. So, back to the let's program. As for climate change and carbon tax, can they still be fooled by the trick they used to hide the decline? CO2 spike, temperature change in 18 years, and these clouds are talking about global warming? Oh no, they changed the climate change. It ain't temperature degrees no more. It's climate. <laughs> We're going to take another question from this side now. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. My question is coming from a place of being a former combat medic for 10 years in the Canadian Forces, a veteran who deals every single day with the hell of PTSD, one who's actually lucky enough to still be here rather than my brothers and sisters who have taken their own lives or who are still fighting just to get basic benefits. My question is, do you believe in a social obligation between Canada and their soldiers how would you understand that obligation to exist, and what would you and your parties do to restore that obligation, the very obligation that the Harper government has said does not exist? Mr. Cressy, yes. Thanks, Gus. Thank you for the question, and it speaks to two really important issues for me. The first is how we honor service, service of all lives, and the second is how we talk about mental health. I thank you for raising that. On service, the Conservative government likes to pretend that it takes care of our veterans, and it does not. It's closing veteran services offices. You know this. We would open them back up. We need a real veterans charter in this country. That's one of the things we've talked about in our party, is a veterans charter to look at issues around pension support, to look at PTSD support. And you know what? The thing with PTSD support, it's not like you just give, give somebody counseling once. If you're living with a mental illness, you need counseling every week. Every single week. That's how we care for each other better. The role of a government and a society is to care for each other and to make sure we provide the services and the support for those who serve so that we do that. Thank you. career Air Force all his life. My son is with the Canadian Army. 
I believe our soldiers are to be proud of. And my, there's a little sign we have at our house. If you don't support the troops, feel free to stand in front of them. So I, I understand the great sacrifice they're making. And the soldiers, like my father before, have brought the freedoms that we enjoy now. And our children who have freedoms, we need to support our soldiers. Uh, they need the equipment that's right for the jobs they need to do. And they need to be down from here. Thank you so much for your question. Ms. Lapka. Thank you very much for that question. It's been an embarrassment, a personal embarrassment of mine for quite some time when the Conservative Party uh, tends to support troops and uses the idea of supporting troops as a baton to hit it with the hands of the other parties in the Parliament. While meanwhile, cutting support to veterans, attacking the veterans' ombudsman, uh, shutting down veterans' services office. Uh, you know, meanwhile, they spend more money on the social media campaign to promote what they're doing for veterans than it would have, kept, than it would have taken, rather, to keep those offices open. So I think that's an embarrassment. I think that's wrong. I think that has to stop. We need more support for PTSD uh, issues. We need more support for mental health issues. And I thank you for the question. I hope you continue working on the issue. so they have maximum access to everything they need, not just you guys. I want to give every cripple, every poor person the same thing. You know what I mean? Nothing special. You don't need nothing special. You just need support when you're down, and hopefully you can put it back later when you're up. And that's what I'm the Bible. Paul Corinthians 2, chapter 8, 14. Your abundance should at the present time be a supply for their want, so theirs can later be a supply for your want. And in that way, he who gathers much doesn't have too much, and he who gathers little doesn't have too little, and that's what Lex does. It shares out the abundance to the guys who are down until you're up and sharing it back. Thank you, Mr. Vaughn. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the service. I think I enjoy my colleagues here. The behavior of the, the federal government of Stephen Harper has been shameful. It's, it's been embarrassing. I, I was talking to an Afghan veteran who has been working on my campaign about this very issue and told me what a program we were developing at City Hall. I hadn't quite found the, the way to package it to bring it to senior levels of government yet around post-traumatic stress disorder. What we know about it is that it works um, in, in different ways with different people and the best way out of it is as a group working together, peer counseling, on peer counseling. We also know that there are priority neighborhoods in Toronto where young people and families are dealing with exactly the same symptoms, but it's not recognized because it's diagnosed only overseas and on their own communities. With gunfire and violence is a significant issue. So part of what we want to do is put together veterans and these young people and build new programs that allow veterans to make another contribution to Canada. They've made great ones so far, they can make better ones still in this particular area because they have expertise, but they also come from those communities. This is the kind of thinking that needs to change up in Ottawa. You have to take what's working locally, amplify it, accelerate it, and you are part of the solution. Thank you. Take a question from the left hand side. Hi. Um, I got an email from you, Mr. Vaughn, um, where you essentially implied that Mr. Cressy was a hypocrite because a member of his party supported pipelines out in Alberta. And you said uh, that pretty well all parties support pipelines. So I would like to hear the candidates' positions on pipelines. And thank you so very much. So this time I'm going to start with uh, Ms. Gross. I think we do need to support our pipelines. Um, we don't need to be supporting uh, our dependence on Saudi oil or foreign oil. I think we have tons of pipes that have been dealing with oil for years in Canada. It will bring the economy, it will bring jobs, it's safe, the, the um, uh, studies have been done, and I really think we should go ahead with it. Ms. Well, the Conservative Party supports all the pipelines, the Liberals support a whole bunch of them, including QC 
Stone Nicelle, the Line 9 Reversal, and the Patchwork Energy East uh, project. And the NDP supports the Energy East as well. The Green Party stands alone saying no to pipelines, no to increasing infrastructure that allows us to perpetuate and increase the production of the oil sands. We don't need fossil fuels. We don't need uh, to tie ourselves to uh, dinosaur energy past. We need to move forward to it with the political will for a low carbon economy and a green future. Thank you very much. I agree 100%. There are lots of clean energies out there. She just can't afford them. Okay? <laughs> There's no money. There's no money for clean. Dirty's cheaper. And we've only got enough money for dirty cheaper. She ain't got more money for cleaner. I do. <laughs> now, when you got enough money, you can buy cleaner. But right now, as long as you always pay the top of your budget and get service to the banks, right. you're never going to have enough money for clean energy. But she's right. Everything she wants, we should have, except she ain't got no money. And I do. So, vote for her. She wants it. <laughs> <laughs> says no to pipelines. The trouble with that is that there's rail in play and rail in the north end of this riding is a significant risk to all of us who live here. The link you can't change the The trains that the derail the Mississauga will move through the DuPont corridor. I move the motions of council to regulate that rail corridor again because we've lost that control with our corporate automobile. The reason I called it the NDP position is the NDP supports Canada East. And Canada East will change oil production from the West by transporting oil from 800,000 barrels plus a day to 1, 1, 1 billion, a million barrels a day. And Canada East will increase by about 25% the oil requirements coming out of the tar sands. In fact, the NDP candidate in the tar sands has said, like, oh, it's not just a job, the world benefits from what Mother Nature has given us to work with. When Joe Cressy spoke against the tar sands and oil sands production, he was corrected by his leader. What the Liberals think for is very simply this, a process. We don't choose an oil pipeline and then say, let's get it approved. What we talk about is a better environmental regulatory process that builds better projects, regulates them better, cleans up effectively when there are accidents, and more importantly than that, trust communities as well as those who will not have a pipeline if First Nations and Aboriginal communities are not on the table. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Climate change is a fine issue. And pipelines are, that's why our party has said no to Northern Gateway, no to Keystone, and no to Line 9. We evaluate resource development pipelines on the basis of the following conditions. So that it must be done sustainably, in partnership with First Nations, and with an eye to long-term prosperity. And I, I need to fact check that there. It is not correct to say that we support energy use. In fact, we have not supported the energy use pipeline. Rather, we have said we will endorse pipelines if they meet those conditions. The Liberals have supported pipelines without conditions. The Liberal Party of Canada supports Energy East, supports Keystone, and supports the reversal of Line 9 without any conditions. Justin Trudeau went to Washington and said that Stephen Harper wasn't doing enough to lobby for Keystone. In this election, there is an environmental choice, and it's the NDP. Say your piece, and there's no rebuttals on these things you said. What he said, he said what you said, and you're just not going to go back and forth. So we're at the end of that particular question. So we're back on the right. Okay, uh, thank you. You may have a chance for a rebuttal right here. As a continuation of that question, um, as a pro science progressives who are known everywhere, the climate's destabilization is imminent and threatening. And the third <laughs> Harper's vision for Canada is tar sands and pipelines. What is your party going to do to de-implement Harper's disastrous plan of dirty energy and carbon pollution rather than providing Canadians with an alternative? Why won't your party say no tar sands, no pipelines as the people of Canada want? Thank you. We start with the Hi, 
clarify your question. I do say no to new pipelines, and I do say no to tar sands extensions. That's obviously the direction we need to go in. Uh, you know, the conservative climate plan I don't really think exists. I haven't seen one yet, and what they've done is been rejected by everyone. I'm not sure what the local plan is, and the NDP plan uh, to put the pricing carbon through cap and trade is uh, being uh, panned by many economists as uh, nonsensical and is overly bureaucratic. The Greens would put a price on carbon at the source through a carbon fee. We would use that money to go into a fund and pay out to Canadians a quarterly dividend. So basically, you're getting a carbon bonus every few months. Um, this sends an important market signal that we need to reduce emissions, we need to move away from dirty, uh, polluting sources of energy, and uh, move forward with a low carbon and green tech future. Essential to agriculture, 
and to all life on Earth. Trading carbon credits and capital trading contribute nothing to the economy. It's not science, it's propaganda by politicians to support plans for a global taxes by a global government with no accountability to those it wishes to tax and control. On a lighter note, I would tell you, I heard that the uh, temperature on Mars has gone up, and I can assure you there's no Martians driving this <laughs> All right. So we're at the end of the meeting. Any questions? And we're starting from over here. Uh, I'd like to offer a wager to uh, Mr. Kresge, the slap shot, Mr. Vaughn. If any of you get elected with 30% of the votes from Trinity Smith, I don't. I would bet you $100 you don't do it. I'm even willing to give you odds of 5 to 1. So my question is, if you're elected, will you introduce a private member's bill to make mandatory voting a law in Canada? Oh my God. Mr. Oh. Absolutely not.
Why not look at weekend voting? Why not look at online voting? We need to engage people to make sure they know that every single vote counts, and we need to make sure it's easy to do. Thank you so much. We're talking about whether people should vote or, or be forced to vote if yes. they haven't. And I, I really think that, do you know what's the only wasted vote? When people vote for something they don't believe in. That's a wasted vote. I think um, when we vote, we should be supporting the principles this country what it was uh, based on. And in our uh, preamble to our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, it says Canada is based on principles which acknowledge the supremacy of God and the rule of law. And what we need in government is integrity, honesty, and I wonder why a lot of young people are tuning out. Perhaps it's because there hasn't been financial integrity. And financial integrity, I think, starts with moral integrity. Right. That's right. Black Thanks. I'm glad you brought up uh, the decline in voter turnout, which is, I think, what your question is getting at. Uh, you know, speaking of this by-election, I'm particularly concerned, of course, that it first coincided with the Ontario vote, and then was smacked down in the middle of a long weekend. So it seems specifically designed to uh, prevent people from voting. I think that's what Stephen Harper's had in mind for a number of years now. So that's a problem. Uh, I'm a personal fan of mandatory voting. I think it needs to come as a whole package of reforms, including proportional representation. And I think more importantly, we need to look at why people aren't bothering to vote anymore. And I think if we did that, we'd find a couple things. Number one, our non-proportional system distorts the vote so that we get false majorities. Smaller parties, like my own party, the Green Party, does not get its, uh, the representation it, it, it deserves based on uh, what people want to see in Parliament. Um, I think we need to uh, consider how politicians are driving down voter turnout uh, in terms of spitting answers out and talking points, taking positions based on polls and what's easy and not what's right, uh, and then misspending and um, freewheeling with the truth, frankly, that has dominated in Ottawa recently. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, in the interest of time, maybe uh, I could just get an answer from 1, 3, and 5. And no, no, that's not right. Uh, no, because it's about climate change. It won't be done, but anyway. Uh, it goes beyond uh, the merely the tar sands and the pipelines. Uh, and uh, transport is actually a huge sector that we don't seem to be doing that much about. Um, and it does, it, that goes beyond the uh, wheelchair lanes on Rotor Street, by the way, for the people that don't like them pushing for bike lanes on Rotor, which curiously seem to need an EA for a line of paint. I bet you're going to pose a question now. Yes, you're quite right. Yes. Uh, air travel is largely ignored, both in our official counts and in environmental assessments, it seems. So not a question. why are we not including proper uh, accounting of carbon dioxide in our environmental assessments when they apply to airports, such as the island airport expansion? Thank you very much. So we start with Mr. Bond. <laughs> It's because the federal environmental process is being cut to the point of being non existent. And one of the things that has to change in Ottawa is we need a ministry of the environment that protects the ministry, it doesn't protect uh, the, the corporations that cause the of the trouble. The issue on, on, on climate change and on how to deal with some of these issues is fundamental. We have got to stop generating greenhouse gas. Private, carbon pricing is part of the solution. Cutting uh, the, 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 the way in which uh, we, we use gas. Fossil fuels, electricity, and urban settings is also a fundamental part of that. Airports are, should be included in that calculation. When you build smarter cities, when you increase and improve the standards of housing that you build, when you do what we did at City Hall, a program that I had to kickstart again after work filled it on the Tower Renewal Program, and you put these buildings back into the environmental contributors instead of detractors, and all of a sudden building smarter cities and cutting greenhouse gas. When you do it with, with, with transit, when you talk about the state of the repair of transit, you aren't sending dirty buses up and down the road. It's sending clean buses up and down the road. You also said that in the impact. But fundamentally, the issue is water in this city. And if we don't get a hand on water infrastructure, we will use so much electricity and generate so much in terms of greenhouse gas that we will never catch up. We will also pollute the water system. Building smarter cities is why the C40 initiative is so important. It's why I disagree with Mr. Pressing. It is not this is not the single largest. Thank you. Cities are the single largest contributor to greenhouse gas. That's the single largest project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Pressing. 
And then you can probably tell I care about the environment. It was about eight years ago, seven years ago, I don't know, I was escorted out of Parliament for calling on Stephen Harper to take action on climate change. I'm ready to get back. And I'm ready because on environmental assessment, for example, so Stephen Harper got it to these firing scientists, but it's more than just restoring environmental assessment. You touched on an important part, it's strengthening it. And you strengthen environmental assessment by not just bringing it back, but looking at the impact on downstream communities, First Nations communities in particular, but also looking at the impact on climate change, as you alluded to there. And so when you talk about the airports as part of that, let's talk about it. Our party, the NDP, all 100 members of our caucus are opposed to jets, are opposed to island expansion, every single member of our caucus. And more than that, we support dissolving the Toronto Port Authority, this unelected, undemocratic body, and giving control of the Port back to the city of Toronto. Thank you so much. Thank you. When we think of renewables and we think of the wind farms that have been going in, I, I have this deep suspicion that we intuitively know that the people that have those wind farms on their land are being hurt by having them there. And when they are talking about the efficiency of these wind farms, they are not uh, the amount of money being made by these wind farms by hydro, then it's being sold at a discounted price to the state. So um, clean, renewable energy sounds wonderful, but it has to be economically viable. And the people that have those, for instance, on their land, need to have their rights respected. Uh, when we talk about environmental assessments, we can't ignore the fact that Stephen Harper gutted uh, the environmental assessment process in Canada in 2011 with his omnibus <coughs> budget bill. So the first thing we need to do is to roll back the, uh, the cuts and gutting the evisceration that he unleashed upon us and uh, start actually improving the legislation instead of undermining it. Um, with respect to the airports, uh, my caucus, like Joe's, agrees entirely that <laughs> there should be no jets at the island airport. Uh, we spent over a billion dollars revitalizing our waterfront. I don't know why we would throw it all away. Uh, instead, we should, we should be focusing on lower carbon forms of mass transit, like rail. Uh, passenger rail hasn't come up yet in this debate, but I think it's important. We need to look at building high speed rail corridors across Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Cannell. Well, I noticed our low tech, our low tech global warming hoaxer doesn't want to hear from me because I flashed my hundred bucks in cash in his face. Say, put your money where your mouth is, and when he backs down, I go flash the cash. Buy my trash, sir. I thought I told you climate hasn't changed in 18 years, and I'm ready to bet. And you come up here with these big doofuses who promise you a carbon tax. Why? You people believe the temperature's been rising. You've been freezing your butts off for five years. What a bunch of morons you are. And you want to vote for a carbon tax? These three are promising you a carbon tax when temperature ain't gone up. And Chicken Little turned his back because he's too scared of a real science graduate to look me in the face. Turn around and you're done. When you sit down, you're done. <laughs> Let's try another question. On this side. Um, my question relates to housing. In 1996, uh, the federal Liberal government dismantled the National Housing Program in Canada for the last uh, 18 years. It uh, was one of the few ACP countries without any federal housing plan. Uh, we see the evidence of, of that all around us and the success of uh, liberal and conservative governments like more housing in the city, the, the wait list for affordable housing in, this, in, this, in Toronto is at an all time high. Can I ask all of the candidates for their plan to inspect of housing and what their parties and record, federal records suggest they actually be able to achieve their plan? Um, Mr. Cressy, you start. Thank you. We have 1.5 million 
have slipped in need of affordable and supportive housing right now in this country. It's shameful. We need to do two specific things. The first thing we need to do is protect the existing housing stock we have. There are 200,000 units coming up on their lease and their support from the federal government. We need to make sure that those are protected, but we need to do more than that. We need to invest and build, not just affordable housing, but supportive and cooperative housing. We need to build housing again. Now, there's a difference between Adam and Adams. Adam's done great work as a city councilor. I voted for because he's done good work on us, but his party has not the Liberal Party cut the National Housing Program. The fact that we have 1.5 million households in need of housing is because they cut it. The last time we got housing investments was because Jack Layton negotiated $1.6 billion out of Colorado's budget. If you want housing, you vote for the party that stands up for housing and always has, and that's the NDP. We do need more low rental housing, and the Christian Heritage Party would support changing the building code to allow new starter homes. And as far as the housing in Toronto that exists, I think it's really unfair when we find out politicians are living in that low rental house at a reduced rate. I think that does disservice to those that really need it. We witness a gradual disintegration of the social safety net in this country to the point uh, that includes housing where many people are forced to live on the streets or forced to choose between eating and paying their hydro bills. Uh, this, is, this is wrong. The Green Party would amend the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada to actually include housing as a right, a fundamental inalienable right. Uh, we would appoint a minister to oversee the implementation of ambitious national housing program, uh, including provincial and municipal cooperation, uh, tax credits for building affordable housing, funding cooperatives, and a dramatic increase uh, in spending on social housing. Uh, we have to eliminate housing as a factor in homelessness. Lack of housing. Right? Casino Terminal pays them with new chips. If you want to live in that housing, you got to get some of the chips from the guys who built the houses. And then, no interest, but you got to pay the house as fast as it depreciates. Now, I know that's hard. Most people don't get it. But that's how interest refinancing would work. As fast as industry builds new collateral, the cashier gives them new chips. And as fast as the collateral is consumed, the people who consume it have to put it back. Now, how can you choose? We're all in favor of more affordable housing. Every one of us. Really? No? They've all said they want more affordable housing, right? We're all the same. I got the way of paying for it. I'm the only guy with the Lens program that can pay the workers yes. to build you your house. But if you vote for them, you'll have the right to it. Thank you. Mr. Bond. Uh, way to go, John. Thank you. Uh, housing is quite on this stage. There is no issue more important than the future of this city and this country than housing. That's what I've been working at eight years at City Hall. It's the reason I've joined local parties, the reason I've joined the to build housing. The housing tax didn't start with the federal government, it started with primary money. They were continued by the NDP government of Queen's Park. The worst land that ran Ontario housing into the ground from the beginning to my first land was completely destroyed. We have got to change this. The last Hallmark budget put $1.8 billion on the table for 10 years. Jack Layton and the NDP, to their credit, negotiated it up to $2.4 billion. It shows that we can collaborate and work together when the issue is critical, and it was critical. And I was proud to be a journalist pushing that issue up the hill. In the ward that I represent, Trey Spadina, we have 12 different housing programs underway right now without support for any level of government. Housing for students, housing for people with disabilities, housing for people, for faculty, for workers, supportive housing, all kinds. <coughs> Alexander Park is going through a major revitalization, 250,000 people is next. There is no counselor, there is no politician in this country who's worked harder than their work and cares more about this issue. It's why we need to support, why we need to support, why this election should be. 
quickly recognize that the bill did not spank him, that the bill did not spank him, that the bill did not spank him, that the bill did not spank him. Transit and housing. 
infrastructure and childcare. We can't do that without it. So we have a couple specific things we've said at the NDP we'll look at. The first is actually the corporate tax rate. It's 15%. It used to be 29. It's among the lowest in the Western world. It's unacceptable. It should be raised. Corporate tax payments. We're losing between 5.8 and $8 billion a year in tax havens. We'll look at that. We'll also look at an additional cent off the gas tax to fund cities beyond making the case for the federal government to invest in cities. Thank you. Thank you. Time for another question. Do you come over to this side? Yeah, I live in an apartment here in the annex, and some people at the far end of the hall in their apartment start smoking marijuana. The smell was so strong, it came all the way down the hall into my apartment. And I got a terrible headache, and I never get headaches. I phoned the police and was stopped. What would I do if marijuana is legalized, as is proposed by Mr. Trudeau? All right, so we we'll start with this one. Well, thanks. I, I mean, I feel sympathy for you having to experience abuses in your hallway. Uh, I think that's one issue. The question of whether marijuana should be legalized, I think, is another issue. Uh, the Green Party has supported the legalization of marijuana for uh, yes, uh, there you long time. Thank you to the marijuana party for the legalization. But at any rate, uh, it's, uh, it's high time that we moved in that direction. I wasn't actually supposed to do that. <laughs> Incredibly uh, expensive. We spend millions of dollars per year on uh, drug cases as they wind their way through the court system, as uh, law enforcement uh, deals with calls about them. Uh, we're wasting this money and we're saddling Canadians with criminal records for something that simply shouldn't be illegal. So, what we need to do is move forward with the legalization scheme. We need to regulate marijuana like uh, tobacco products, raise tax revenues from it and uh, stop treating Canadians like criminals for engaging in activities uh, that don't cause societal harms. And with respect to your issue, uh, I certainly feel sympathy and I'm, I'm sure that uh, something can be worked out with the building. Thank you. Well, you know, back in 2006, University of Saskatchewan found that marijuana grows in the brain cells, which is why it's good for Alzheimer's and dementia. So, sir, breathe in deep. <laughs> now, if you Google for John Turnell and marijuana, you'll find that I'm needing 300 patients in federal court right now to repeal the marijuana laws. Now, I'm not talking about smoking the bud to laugh a little bit, laughing grass. I'm talking about needing the juice and the oil to fight the Fukushima cancers we're all going to be getting real soon. Notice how a lot of your old friends get cancer and they're gone in two months. Or little kids are just gone. That's the Fukushima fallout they didn't tell you about. But marijuana oil and juice, next to fasting, go see my YouTube video if you're all fast, because fasting starves the cancer and it doesn't starve the healthy cells. The point is, we got to repeal the marijuana laws and get the juice and the oil or we ain't going to survive without it. One of the funny things about running for local party is the conservative attack hat is constantly focusing on marijuana. You get a lot of great interesting canvases at the doorstep. And I'm sometimes worried that they won't remember to vote for us, but uh, if you know it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an important issue. And the war on drugs has not produced anything other than misery. It's wasting a lot of money. The mandatory minimum sentence that some parties have proposed are not good ways to deal with, with the issues that confront us. We have got to deal with drugs as a health care issue and a health care issue for Almost like that would be the way that you start to turn around and deal with some of the issues that you present. What you talk about is a public health issue. When we regulate tobacco and we, and we legalize it and we bring it into the public sphere and we also create resources on it to facilitate that public health conversation, issues like yours can be addressed. They can be addressed when they're done best at the local level. And part of the strategy on dealing with crime and dealing with any social behavior is to once again invest in cities and allow public health determine how to make your life better, but also make better the life of the person consuming the marijuana, which when they're at risk of arrest, at risk of, of being poisoned by the chemicals that sometimes place this drug, is the issue. We need to deal with drug health health care issue. And that's why the Liberal Party is taking the issue to the state. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, and thanks for the question. Um, well, on the table, I have smoked pot in the past, but it's not like, I don't like it that much, so it's not for me. Just, although I thought Jack Layton had a better line, which was, I inhale, but I never exhale. <laughs> but it's, it's not for me. But I will tell you, in our party, the NDP has consistently worked to decriminalize marijuana. That's our point of view, and when we come at it from that lens because we don't think the war on drugs is working, it's not. I'm firmly opposed to mandatory minimums. They don't work. They don't work south of the border, and Harper's mandatory minimums, which the Liberal Party voted for, don't work either. And I approach this from a health promotion of the harm reduction point of view, and that's why we support decriminalization. The Center for Addiction and Mental Health, many of you know it well, it's right here in Toronto, has said that a decriminalization approach would be best served for health promotion and harm reduction. And that's why our party supports that approach. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I won't speak for the CHP on this. I'll speak personally on this. Um, I've spent, in the last 20 years, I've spent 10 years in jail because of 22 arrests in front of the abortion clinic. I deal with these women every day in prison who are uh, smoking marijuana. I've read quite a bit of literature on it. And they've done a long stern, they say, the drug addiction, that marijuana is a gateway drug. It does lead to others. But secondly, um, there's been a long term study of people that have smoked marijuana quite regularly over a 10 year period. They found that the IQ of these people is permanently lost, so they stop using the marijuana, but their IQ does not return to custody. So um, I often tell the women in prison, if God wanted you to smoke, you would have been born with a chimney on your head. Thank you, Ms. Durable. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to make a quick announcement. We're getting um, to the end. We have to allow 10 minutes for the final statement, so that video only allows for three more questions, so it'll be one, two, three. I'm real sorry. I admire your civic engagement, but that's all we're going to have time to do. I'm real sorry about that. So we'll start with you, ma'am. Thank you. And thank you, Adam, for talking about public health, because that was one of the questions that I wanted to address. I feel disappointed that, I haven't, that we haven't heard anything from any of you around any health, community, and social service initiatives, not only within our city or province, but within the country. Um, there is a dearth, a dearth of community and health-based services, certainly in Toronto, we're set to leave the city and throughout the whole country, um, and also for our first patients. So you'd like to an opinion of our Not just an opinion, and not just generalizations, but your actual intentions. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we'll start with Mr. Trumel. Green. Okay, in Argentina, when the bank, when the government was broke and they couldn't afford to provide the services you wanted, the union said, you're not laying anybody off anymore, okay? You can't bring your million dollar bond to a bank to get bills to pay us. We'll take ten dollar bonds in our paycheck as long as we can use them for hydro taxes, medical and licenses. So the Argentine government's provincial were forced to pay all their unions and government employees with small denomination provincial bonds. You could use for Ontario Hydro, Ontario Medical, licenses. My point is, as fast as they build new hospitals and they're paid with new chips, you can earn those chips to be able to pay health care you can now afford. So it's always the same interest refinancing program that enables it all. Right. Thank you very much. Mr. Bond. The Canada Health Act needs to be respected. The importance of Paul Martin signed the new strengthened and easy access to good, strong public health care is a fundamental principle and value that I think all parties should share. Unfortunately, we can't make this tonight, we may disagree. When it gets to health care, the issue of can I come back to is housing care. We have established that she is well. Housing perspective shows that when you house people with mental health and addiction issues, you save the healthcare system $26,000 per person per year. If you want to know where your healthcare money is, it's not happening in housing. When you stabilize people's living arrangements, 
seniors in particular, who we talked about was also one of the programs we're bringing forward in the, in the ward. When you stabilize people's housing, you can deal with their health issues. In fact, you drive savings into the health care budget. That's why I'm running. We know this to just end. You've heard me say it over and over again. Cities are doing this. Vancouver's doing it brilliantly. We have gone to Vancouver and studied. We're doing it here in Toronto. We're trying. We need to amplify it, accelerate these policies. The way to get the health care budget is to house it. It requires an agenda. It's why we need this. And all why we need it. Thank you so much. Thank you, President. Instructing our folks with social services is more than about building a care in society. It's about strengthening the degree in which we can build an economy. It's about making sure people are well off. And so there's a couple specific areas at the federal level I want to come to. Immigrant health services. The federal government has cut them. We see it, I hear it all the time on the doors. We should restore that funding. That's the first. The second, when we talk about public health, we need, and it came up earlier to talk about mental health. We actually need a national mental health strategy in this country, and to look at suicide prevention, especially among our Indigenous and First Nations youth and their LGBTQ youth. And the third for me is I'm coming to child care. I met with some folks recently around child care, Martha Friendly, many of you will know, and we talked about the principles, principles on which we could build national child care. And it's not just affordability and universality, it's not just looking at access, it's looking at flexibility. Because there's so many single parents out there, and they need help with child care overnight, not just 9 to 5. Those are three areas I'd like to look at. Thank you, Mr. President. We are concerned about our health care. 4,000 people have died in hospitals due to infection. A Center for Health Design in California has set the two biggest issues in, in reducing um, infections is to have single room occupancies filled with individual toilets. Right now, the government is giving 14% transfer funds into our healthcare system. It had been doing 50%. CHP would bring that up to 25%. And a lot of rural areas are not getting the health care they need. They would support a program where doctors would have their tuition paid, loan free, if they would work for five years in a rural community to pay back after they brought their placement. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lachlan. Thank you for the question. Um, it's the broad area, obviously, and there's so much that I can cover that uh, I'll try to focus on just a, a few issues. Uh, first of all, let me say it concerns me that we have a Prime Minister whose uh, full-time job used to be to dismantle our national health care system. Uh, it's something that we should be proud of and can protect. Um, with respect to medical professionals, uh, the new party is committed to providing more training, to uh, enhancing the process for recognizing foreign credentials, so that we can get more medical professionals out there working in our communities. Uh, I also want to talk about something that doesn't take a long time, but it's preventative medicine. The idea that we need to promote health and start talking about how we can stop people from getting sick in the first place, rather than simply focus on treating them after they're ill, which of course is important as well, but not to the exclusion of uh, trying to promote health. Uh, and finally, uh, this other issue I haven't had a chance to bring yet, up yet, but it's important to guarantee people income to eradicate poverty, raise people up out of poverty, because poverty is the single biggest determinant of ill health.
the Liberal Party position is not to reopen the tripartite agreement, tripartite agreement that prevents just that that's the end of the issue. We have to do more than that. We just heard we should get rid of the Port Authority. Getting rid of the Port Authority, I can tell you this, this is like having experience in government matters. If you got rid of the Port Authority, you would hand it over to the city of Toronto. I can tell you, having fought this issue almost single-handedly for the last eight years, with community groups, but with very little support of city council, if you did that, you would get jets, you would get bridges, you would get extensions, so bloody fast you wouldn't know what hit you. It is the most irresponsible approach I have ever heard for waterfront issues. We have got to change the Port Authority. It wasn't a great idea when it was created, but we have to change it now. We have to make it a check and a balance against the very aggressive city council where there are no votes there to stop this. NDP votes on council support of RJ jobs and vote against the interests of this rider. That's wrong. So we have to do two things more than just simply not open the tripartite agreement. The first thing is we have to make sure the Port Authority is a public accountable body with constituents that touch the water and represents the balance of waterfront needs, not just the industrialization of the port. And the second thing that the federal designation for the Borough Sanctuary on the Toronto Islands, it hasn't been done for 25 years. No federal MP from this riding has done it. That has to change. Job one on the waterfront when we get to Ottawa. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Okay, 30 seconds for everybody else. Well, let's set the record clear. It was not the Toronto Port Authority that stopped Jets or Island expansion. It was community mobilization. It was members of the <laughs> It is an undemocratic, illegitimate body. We should dissolve it, give it control of it back to the city. It used to be filled with liberal insiders and cronies. It's now filled with conservative insiders and cronies. The city of Toronto should have control of the courts. That's our party policy. Ms. Rose? Pass. Ms. Latrick? Well, I've said it once and I'll say it again. The new party's clear no jets at the Toronto waterfront, and I believe we should abolish the Toronto Port Authority. Mr. Prim, uh, amazing passes. Uh, we have a military tradition in this country. It started with my piercing in the 60s. And that is that uh, our military presence has always been to be peacekeepers until Stephen Harper was elected to that. And I would like to know from the panel what, how you see Canada's role Thank you very much, and we'll start with Mr. Preston. Thank you. Yeah, our role in the world should be in the cause of peace, democracy, and human rights. That's what we should be doing. And I think you pointed out quite rightly that we used to be known for our peacekeeping abilities. Unfortunately, under Stephen Harper, it has been nothing but cut, cut, cut. Now, I've spent time living and working in West and Southern Africa, where they are, under the Harper government, closing offices. And so a voice for peace and human rights is more than peacekeepers, it's about official development and assistance. But when we talk about peacekeepers, it's more than blue helmets and men in blue helmets standing in between people. It's about peacemakers and the role of women in it. This is something Norway's done really well with peacemakers and the peacekeeping movement. We can be a voice for peacekeeping and peace building and making, but the center for peace out of all, that's something our party and Paul Dewar has proposed. And it's more than just men and women. This is one of the things I like to talk about in peace. It is about the role of communities and the role of women in being part of peacekeeping and peacemaking. Thanks. Again, I speak as a, a military brat, but I believe that um, a military to be um, a restraining uh, power and force needs to be uh, upfront and muscular, and I think Canada has carried more punch than its weight. It has really gone beyond in supporting Ukraine. I really believe that um, our military deserves to um, support justice. That the head of the Northern Command military officer made this statement. He said, peace is not about the absence of hostility, it's about the presence of justice. So I think Canada is all about justice. And an example would be standing up for Israel in uh, protocol. And I really think we need to be muscular because our soldiers deserve our support. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I and the Green Party share uh, Lester Pearson's vision of Canada on the world stage as promoters of peace and a country that's an honest broker and can work together with other countries to promote peaceful uh, solutions. I'm concerned that this dream is being rolled back. Actually, I'm not concerned. I'm really upset that it's being rolled back under the uh, Harper government. Uh, for example, moving uh, CETA into DFAT, I think, signaled that we want to take less of a role in the international scene in terms of promoting uh, development and assisting other countries, and I think that's wrong. Uh, we have problems at home. We're a rich country. Uh, we're much better off than some of our international neighbors, and our responsibility uh, is to help them. Uh, I also think this is part of an international step backwards that we've been taking in many arenas, uh, and chiefly among them is uh, our role as an obstructor in international climate change negotiations, uh, which of course, runaway climate change uh, is the biggest threat to international peace and security that this planet has ever known. Well, I think Canada blew all of our peacemaker cred a few years ago. We used to have it, it's now gone. You know, M-PESA is the satellite, because of the satellite over Africa, the M-PESA system started. All the poor Africans got cell phones, and M-PESA allowed them to transfer minutes, mobile cell phone minutes, to pay for things. So, it was using an alternate currency, cell phone minutes, for people who had no other money. And guess what? Their economies have boomed. Now, who's the guy who financed that satellite? Noah Margaret He provided free health care for all his people, free education for all his people, he forced you to own a house you couldn't rent, you had to buy, and he lent it to you interest free and forced you to buy a house. You couldn't rent tools, you had to buy it, own it, no renting in Libya. He built the greatest rock river project in history, and Canada went and murdered St. Muammar Gaddafi, one of my great heroes, a leader who never stole from his people. Now, if you believe your mainstream media, you are as dense as you sound, okay? You've been lied to, and Africa knows the truth about Moabar, and we're going to get it someday. Thank you, Mr. Gervell, I think. I didn't Mr. know that, did you? That's enough. One of the easiest things about joining the Liberal Party is looking back on the crowd record of where, where they put Canada on the stage. Whether it's Louis St. Laurent, the Suez Canal crisis, and the, and the, 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 the project that won Mike Pearson's Nobel Prize, whether it's Pearson and Vietnam, whether it's Trio, the extraordinary bravery of standing up to the Americans in Chile and allowing refugees to come into the consulate and get to Canada for safekeeping many friends. It's also about Jean Chrétien, one of the proudest and most extraordinary moments as a Canadian I ever witnessed was the goodbye to Jean Chrétien down at the Air Canada Center when he kept Canada out of the war in the world. This is it's a bottle for being the leaf on the back. You're a little less confident doing that these days, and as my 16-year-old head says into the world, we need to change that. One of the ways of change is you should do what I did when I was young. I went to Nicaragua and El Salvador and Chile, and I worked in building community radios around the world to give people a voice. But I also went back to El Salvador to protect the vote in that country and embrace democracy. This is what Canada does. We mediate, we moderate, we bring conversation and solutions to the world stage that the Liberals have the most extraordinary and the proudest record on that file that I'm proud of you and speak to that history and Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, at the end of the questions, and now we're going to do two-minute closing statements and we're going to reverse the order. And I'm sure Mr. Vaughn is very grateful for that. Mr. Vaughn, we're going to start with you. Uh, well, thank you to the Residents Association and this in the Northeast Quadrant of this riding. Thank you to my colleagues on stage, but of course, thank you to the voters, the constituents, the residents of this riding. I have the honor of serving as a local councillor, and I want the honor to serve you up all of But the issues that we're confronting are the same ones that I spoke to you about the last two elections. We have got to get back to building great cities. Our economy depends on it. Our cities and our neighborhoods depend on it. Fundamentally, the future depends on getting to Toronto, getting this part of Toronto, getting the lessons from this part of Toronto, and taking it to the world stage through Ottawa. We, it's not just about building a better Canada. We have an opportunity to export the ideas, and the values, and the processes, and the 
techniques and the programs around the world. That is what we can do as Canadians. But we need to do it up in Ottawa, and we need to do it for ourselves first. We need to deliver better housing, better programs for Aboriginal and rural communities. But we also need to get back in the cities and deliver on transit, on cultural infrastructure, on aquatic and water infrastructure. And fundamentally, we have got to start building housing for each other again. Housing for seniors, for workers, for elderly people, for students, for faculty. We have got to find ways to deliver low income ownership as well as rent. We have to support our co ops. We have to restore the capacity in this country to care for one another by delivering shelter to one another. It's the way you drive this agenda forward. It's why I joined the Liberal Party. It's why I'm asking you to join me in this campaign to make cities matter. It's fundamental to the future of all of us. And I hope I can get your support. Thank you. Now, you'll remember I said that marijuana grows new brain cells, which explains why it's good for dementia and Alzheimer's. And, of course, they're not for marijuana. I am. I'm leaving the fight. And the point is, it explains why I'm so sharp and they're so dull. Get me? <laughs> now, first of all, I'm sure you're not as dumbed down as you seem to the camera, missing all the jokes. I'm sure 90% of you are party clappers, and I've offended your parties by making fun of the climate issue, okay? And I, I understand why none of the jokes worked after that. But you've got to realize, you've been lied to. How can you look at no change in temperature in 18 years and vote for people who want to give you a carbon tax, who keep talking about climate change? Hey, when it was global warming, they could say, wow, a degree is bad. But now they can't say that no more, so they changed it to anything. <laughs> What's a climb? Up or down? They don't know, but they're scared. Well, I'm trying to tell you, they wouldn't have changed it from the precision of a temperature degree of danger to the imprecision of a climb of danger, unless it was a fraud. And I bet the Green Party candidate, Adriana, whatever her name, two years ago, a hundred bucks, the temperature hadn't risen. She ain't paid yet. She's a stiff. And I'm saying these candidates won't take my hundred dollar bet either that the temperature hasn't risen. And if any of you guys got the balls, stand up too. Woo! Thank you. No balls. All right. Like that. You've done it, Mr. You've done it, sir. What's your hundred bucks? Relax. I've got another hundred dollars spent. You guys can take it outside. We're gonna do we're not gonna do that here. Sure. Enough. We're gonna listen to the other candidates. You go better now. Okay, let's laugh, Chuck. You can calm yourself and now we'll start. <laughs> Don't talk climate change. Hey, come on, Chuck. Do you mind? Sir, the deal is, you respect the other candidates when I ask you to. You yield the floor, you have your turn, and it's over. We're going to listen to the slap chat now, and then we're going to be quiet. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, first of all, thank all of you for being here. Thank you to the organizers, thank you to the candidates. I've really enjoyed this debate tonight, and I'm really inspired to see so many of you out here tonight asking questions about the issues uh, that really matter. And we've got to talk about a lot of them. Um, there's a few others I want to use this opportunity to bring up that, uh, that we didn't discuss, but that I'm not a position on that's unique with the other parties and that I think is important. Uh, you know, we talked about the pipelines. I'm the only candidate without the pipeline. Um, I'm the only candidate whose party opposes the very existence of the temporary foreign workers program because it creates two classes of workers, one with uh, no rights to, to move here and with few legal protections. Uh, the only party to call for a tax or a fee on carbon at the source, and the only party to uh, have the courage, I think, to call for the regulation of sex work rather than uh, outlawing it and uh, simply hoping that it goes away into the shadows. So I want to ask you tonight to consider voting for me because I will always stand up for what's right, not what's popular, not what's easy, not what the polls say, but what science and evidence tells us is right. Um, vote for me because I listen more than I talk. <laughs> I will listen to you. I will bring your concerns uh, to Ottawa. 
And as a Green MP, I will have the independence to represent you in your views. Uh, the Green Party doesn't whip its MPs. We don't force MPs to vote so that this particular way. I'll be free to vote in line with my own conscience and the wills of uh, you, my constituents. Um, in this election, what I'm telling people is that the Green vote is a strategic vote. We don't have to worry about uh, changing the government. It's going to be conservative, unfortunately, after this by-election, whether we like it or not. And one more Liberal MP, one more NDP MP won't make a difference in Ottawa. But if you send a message to Ottawa by electing me as your Green MP, I promise you it'll send a message that parties can't ignore, and they'll do nothing but talk about green issues, the issues I care about, the issues we all care about in the next election. I thank you for your patience in being here, and uh, I just think this is such a well-behaved group. Um, I also like the idea of being able to be free to speak in your party for what you believe in, to behave like a bunch of sheep that have been trained to bleed on command immediately. It's not my idea of democracy. You had Stephen Woodworth and Mike Werbaugh propose bills that would open up the discussion on when life begins with the unborn. And they were shut down in the government and told that uh, they would not even be allowed to discuss it, let alone decide when does life begin and when are the rights of the unborn. You may know in this country, a child can be aborted right up through the nine months and even during the delivery process. That that baby has no protection as a person under law until it's separated from the mother. There's a hundred thousand people each year missing. There are people. That line between born and unborn needs to be removed. The unborn deserve protection in law. And I ask you to uh, consider that and vote for uh, a party that will stand up for the rights of all people, every single human being, from conception to natural death. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, Mr. President. I well, thank all of you for coming and the organizers and, and my fellow candidates and Gus for moderating that was not easy. Listen, I've spent my life working on local, national, and international issues right around the country and around the world. And I've learned a lot, but I've never had more fun than I have in the last three months knocking on doors. And one of the things I hear a lot when I'm knocking on doors, and this one hurts, is when people say, and I hear it too much, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who I vote for, you're all the same. I hear that a lot. But it matters so much. Progressive politics matters. Climate change and standing up for our environment matters. Social justice matters. Working together to defeat Stephen Harper matters. It really, really matters. And this by-election for me, well, it's about continuing the work that Olivia Chow has done here and doing that by standing up for progressive issues downtown and standing up to Stephen Harper. And I know many of you, I've talked to many, you said I have a tough choice to make. Well, in making that choice, I hope you join me in standing with the environmental community and the First Nations by standing against climate change and the Keystone Pipeline. I hope you join me by saying yes to working together and cooperating to, Stephen, to beat Stephen Harper. And I hope you join me in understanding that progressive politics, standing on the side of justice and a progressive vision for our country, really matters. It always has. And in Trinity Spadina, in the last election, we'll ever have a Trinity Spadina. I hope we carry on that legacy, and I hope to earn your support. Thank you so much. Just before you go, a couple of things. Uh, when it comes to the democratic process, this is where the rubber hits the road. I can't tell you how uh, uh, respectful I am of you for uh, being the audience who work tonight. 
we had a wide variety of uh, things being said, and some even outrageous. But remember this, outrageous things, as long as it's not saying there's fire in a fabric clear or there is one, is not a hanging offense, it's not even being kicked out of offense. A bridge of the free speech is not what we're about. So the speakers kept to their kept to their time limits. There was a bit of cross talk, but they stopped when asked. So I think the the candidates deserve a very big round of applause.